here in Nigeria, where the government has indefinitely suspended the operations of Twitter over what Twitter. it described has been condemned by rights campaigners and diplomats as a gag in free speech. Well, it seems the chirping of the bird has been silenced for now. Hopefully, that does not damage the unity of the country. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post, where we don't cover the news, we cover the way the news is covered. Here are the media stories we're examining this week. Nigeria, the tweet from the president's account that ended up getting Twitter banned right across the country. Election day in Algeria. The government is feeling the heat on the streets. Its response is to arrest journalists and take a broadcaster off the air. Stereotypes then and now. Postcards from the colonial era that shaped perceptions of Africa and its people. And exposing the film industry. The shaman requires you undergo the ritual tea ceremony first. And some of the stereotypes it cannot resist to this very day. We begin with Africa's most populous country, Nigeria. 200 million plus, a market with the most internet users on the continent. Two weeks ago, the government, led by former military man Mohamedou Buhari, put an indefinite ban on Twitter, a platform used by roughly 40 million citizens. The ban was announced just after Twitter had deleted a tweet by the president himself that violated the company's rules on abusive behavior. There was some threatening language in there, aimed at secessionists in the South. Nigeria is two years away from its next national election, a countrywide movement, hashtagged end SARS, out to stop police brutality, has put the Buhari government on the defensive, and Twitter has been central to that story for organizers, activists, and the journalists covering them. Members of the Buhari government have long warned of the dangers of social media. Now it's reportedly looking to China, the architect of the Great Firewall, for ideas on how to bring critical voices under government control. Our starting point this week is Nigeria's biggest city, Lagos. To understand how Twitter has come to be banned in Nigeria, you have to start with the history. The civil war 50 years ago over the region of Biafra. The war crimes that were committed there. The humanitarian catastrophe that unfolded. Then add in the recent flare-ups and power struggles in that same area of the country. That's part of the context. And that is why President Muhammadu Buhari's tweet, the one that warned his opponents, that those of us who went through the war will treat them in the language they understand was so offensive. In Nigeria, talking about treating people in the language they would understand is like perhaps the German government talking about the Holocaust. It's like the Hutus and the Tutsis in Rwanda talking about the genocide that happened there. Do you mean that the women that were raped, that's the language they would understand? Do you mean the estimated 3 million Igbos and other minorities that were killed during the war? That's the language they would understand. Twitter's response was not to block the president's account or to ban Buhari from the platform. It just deleted his tweet for violating its policy on abusive behavior. Then Buhari's government blocked Twitter criminalized its use for the 40 million Nigerians who have accounts for what it called undermining Nigeria's corporate existence. Persistently and uh, continuously, Twitter has allowed its platform to be used by people who are promoting the disintegration of Nigeria. Twitter's mission in Nigeria is very suspect. What is the agenda? We will suspend the operation of Twitter until such a time that we can sit down together and we will agree to stop the use of the platform to promote insurgency and to promote, uh, you know, uh, secession. It's just a smokescreen. The government has never been happy with Twitter at least since October 2020, the Nigerian government has been very unhappy with Twitter. If this bad stands, it's a dagger into the heart of democracy and the right of the people to expression. It's a frontal attack on the freedom of the press. The suspension of Twitter in Nigeria is not about Twitter. 
it's not even only about social media. It's about the online civic space, which is the last standing civic space for Nigerians and government wants to control that space. Secondly, this is very clearly about NSAS protest that happened in October 2020. NSAS, NSAS. That is where the Buhari government's antagonistic relationship with Twitter was defined. With the end SARS movement that peaked late last year and mobilized millions. SARS was a police unit, the special anti-robbery squad, notorious for its extrajudicial killing of young Nigerians and for its culture of corruption. The end SARS movement was built around that hashtag. It was leaderless, decentralized, and largely because of Twitter, it was everywhere. This is a protest that was born on social media. Shocking scenes leading to an international outcry. The end SARS protest is undoubtedly the biggest protest in Nigerian history that wasn't convened by anyone. Twitter was that platform that gave people a voice to express their grievances against the police. And it caught fire. In the aftermath of the protest, you know, when government sent soldiers to the toll plaza to kill and injure protesters. But guess what? Every 20th of the month, young Nigerians go back to Twitter to talk about what happened uh, on the 9th of October 2020. The protest that government thought it killed forcibly by sending soldiers to the toll gate is still alive. The reason why the protests really hit the government is because they're not used to this kind of protests. They're used to protests where there's a leader that they can reach out to, maybe bribe, maybe harass, maybe intimidate. But this time, there wasn't a leader to harass. There wasn't a leader to buy over. There were pockets of organizers across the country. That doesn't work according to their playbook of control and manipulation. So. It is definitely about answers. It's definitely about the pettiness of getting back at Twitter. Twitter has also been an active, critical space for Nigerians unhappy with their government's handling of a struggling economy and the president's inability to quell the secessionist movement in the South. The ban on the platform led to a fresh round of protests. And while Nigerian news outlets are able to cover them, the ban has robbed them of an important, immediate platform. Not all print and online outlets are complying with the ban on tweeting. Many are simply defying it. Broadcasters are different. Nigeria's broadcasting regulator, the NBC, has warned channels that ignoring the ban could cost them their license to operate. The NBC has been the regulator that holds you by your neck and tells you when to breathe and when to stop breathing. Channels Television, for instance, they have about 4.5 million followers on Twitter. They immediately stopped when the announcement happened because they don't want to be fined or they don't want their licenses withdrawn by the Nigerian government. Businesses are also losing out. Businesses promoting their work online, talking to customers online. And the tech sector helped Nigeria come out of a recession most recently. So it is very weird that Nigeria will then be doing this, no thought about the long-term impact of what they've done you know, on this, particularly for a sector that helped rescue Nigeria from a recession. There are 130 million Nigerians aged 18 or younger. It is a huge tech-savvy demographic that's been circumventing the Twitter ban, sending search engines into overdrive, looking for VPNs. The Buhari government does not mince words on the dangers it sees in the digital space. Late last year, at the height of the end SARS unrest, Information Minister Lai Mohammed told a parliamentary committee that if we don't regulate social media, it will destroy us. This past week, it was reported that Mohammed met with the Cyberspace Administration of China, which oversees the Great Firewall. We asked him about that and whether China is now advising Nigeria on its approach to social media. Probably somebody has cloned my person, but I never had any meeting with any Chinese company. So we put the question another way. Is China's regulatory approach a model the Buhari government wants for Nigeria? We are open to uh, collaboration from any part of the world.
I, I don't know how far they've gone, but I do know that there was there was contact with, with China about building an internet firewall. And if, as a government, you place a ban on Twitter, you want to wipe people off Twitter. People circumvent it by using VPN. You're not going to sit down and say that's the end. You, you understand that the ban is not effective. A firewall is quite an extremely expensive. I know the Chinese government very well. And where they have interest, they don't mind even saying, you know what, let's fund it for you guys. And that's where I think all Nigerians need to be concerned. Nigeria's problem is not Twitter. The threat to national unity, the threat to Nigeria's corporate existence has nothing to do with Twitter. It's good governance. Everyone who cares about democracy, everyone who cares about civic rights, if this ban stands, the next two years of the Buhari government will be really tough for the people. Turning to Algeria now and a historic moment, the first parliamentary elections there since former President Abdelaziz Bouteflika was ousted in 2019. Flo Phillips is here with the latest, starting with how the authorities tighten the screws on the press just before voting day. Which, Richard, is something they promised they would never do. Just 48 hours before the polls opened, security services arrested two well-known journalists, Khaled Drareni, founder of the website Kaspar Tribune, and Ehsan El Khadi, director of two media outlets, Radio M and Maghreb Emergent. Those outlets have been critical of the government, and the pair have been targeted before. El Khadi's outlets have been blocked numerous times for supposedly insulting the president. And Drareni was only released from prison this past February after 11 months behind bars for undermining national security. In this case, they were released one day later, but they were out of the reporting mix for a crucial 24-hour period, which sounds tactical. Exactly. And you've got to remember that Drareni, El Qadi and their outlets were thrown to prominence two years ago for their coverage of the mass protest movement, Hirak, that ended Bouteflika's 20 years in power. And that Hirak movement has been back on the streets, protesting many of the same issues that they did in 2019. Corruption, military rule, the lack of free speech. This time, however, they were also calling on Algerians to boycott the election. So the government saying with these arrests was quite clear, stop opposition media from getting the word out on the boycott. But the authorities' plan didn't exactly pan out. The voter turnout was very low, just 30%. And that's the official number. That's the domestic media. What about reporting from the outside? They care about that too. They do, and it's probably got something to do with the fact they don't want anyone to know about the low voter turnout. Just a day after the election, the Ministry for Communication decided to suspend the broadcast license for the international news channel France 24. Now, the official reason given was, quote, clear and repeated hostility towards Algeria and its institutions. And this goes back to another historic grievance. France 24 is owned by the French government, which has repeatedly rejected requests from Algiers for some kind of official recognition or apology for the atrocities that were committed by France during their period of colonial rule. Now, this past January, President Macron said that there will be, quote, no repentance and no apology. The Algerian government was equally unapologetic when it took France 24 off the air. Thanks, Will. In the late 19th century, there was a form of mass media, a visual one that predated television by about 50 years. Any guesses as to what that medium was? Postcards. Postcards were a European media phenomenon. The photos let people see the world without leaving their home. And like many modern forms of media, they were visual, cheap, and relatively easy to distribute. But it was the era of colonialism, and postcards were also a means of asserting racial superiority. Photographers were sent with colonizers to take pictures of what they saw, sometimes of what they wanted to see, from the most mundane aspects of life to some disturbing images of colonial brutality. The European powers went home long ago, but the stereotypes in those images continue to shape perceptions of Africa today. The Listening Post's Tarek Nafa now on the legacy of postcards from days gone by.
It's very easy for us now to think of a postcard as a kind of happy snap from holidays, right? The sort of wish you were here to family and friends. But they were in their own day a new media craze. They were produced specifically to construct uh, a particular image of Africa and Africans. The scramble for Africa, you know, occurred 1884-ish, where European powers basically carved up different uh, parts of Africa to colonize. Part of that process was to somehow justify colonization, why uh, one nation would take over another nation. They sent missionaries, they sent politicians, and they sent photographers. The people with the cameras um, get to dictate how we see, who we think we're seeing, what we think we're seeing. And so I think that's part of what makes those images so dangerous. They are images that show Europe's civilizing mission as the men behind it wanted it to be seen. The monuments of empire, courthouses, churches, ports, and train stations. And the locals, those in need of civilizing. Photography was a major component of European colonialism. And the late 19th and early 20th century was the golden age of postcards an early form of mass media. The images taken by an assortment of commercial photographers, missionaries, ethnographers, and colonial administrators were printed and posted back home billions of times, shaping Europe's view of Africa and the Orient. They come under three very loose themes. The kind of highly uh, sexualized, eroticized um, woman, you know, Arab woman or African woman, you know, bare chested, often posed in a suggestive way. The other theme would be uh, Africans as servers, you know, always in a kind of domesticated state, servants to colonial administrators or missionaries or military personnel. And then the third, the African as savage, you know, African warriors as savage, as uncivilized, um, not to be trusted. This is Nigeria, and it's titled Igbo Hunters with uh, flintlock guns. Um, and this was a very common type, showing sort of the barbarity or the savagery of, of Africans, and particularly as hunters. And so this particular image is basically just showing them in their everyday clothing. And you can see that it's actually been staged to some extent because you have two individuals on either side who are kneeling and sort of looking directly at the camera. So there's a, an understanding of cooperation and collaboration in creating this image. Photographers carefully selected both their subjects and their surroundings. For those in the business of selling postcards, there was a commercial interest in making images that tantalized or in some way fed into a pre-existing bias. You can see that clearly in images from France's colonial encounter with North Africa. Faced with women who did not conform with their exotic fantasy, photographers simply made up photos that did. They had this mythology of Algerians as kind of over-sexualized. Um, they had the image of the harem in their mind. But when they arrived, the Algerians looked nothing like the French had imagined them. Many of the women were veiled or um, covered, and so they were inaccessible to the photographer's gaze. They ended up hiring people to act as models. They set up studios. They asked the women to pose in the way that the colonizers had imagined those people. Then they produced postcards and sent them back to France to say, this is what these people are like, and they need our help. This was a very much a commercially driven business, and it was photographers, people running photographic studios that were looking for cards that, that they could sell. They could sell cheaply. And all these postcard producers and photographers were copying each other. They were ruthless in stealing other people's ideas and images. So this is the way in which these genres kind of reproduce themselves over time. The lands of those depicted in the postcards have long since won their independence. But the cultural impact, the stain of the imagery, lives on. You can trace the link between depictions of black and brown bodies today 
and the often degrading and orientalist depictions of the colonial period. Then, like now, the bodies of those deemed in some way foreign are more likely to show up in the media starving, destitute, naked or dead. The only bodies that we see in the media are usually brown and black bodies from other countries. That ends up producing an, a vision of the world where violence is something that happens elsewhere to nameless victims. I used to think that something about being an American was the reason that we didn't see Americans' bodies in the media, um, but then I saw Michael Brown's body on the front page of the New York Times, and he's an American. So it seems to me that there's something different operating that should force us to ask questions about whose bodies are made visible, whose bodies are hidden, and why, and what work those images do. The uh, continuing visions um, or images of kind of black death and trauma has definitely continued um, from the past. Those images are enduring. If you have no association with the person as a human being, when that humanity is removed, it's easier to think about that person as, as, as an object, almost as a, like a scientific, you know, object. Uh, there is no agency, there is no humanity. There are layers to these postcards. They tell us a lot about the colonial mindset. And in a time before photos appeared in newspapers, they also served as a form of photojournalism. But too many of these images stripped the subjects of their humanity. They are the visual expression of a racial hierarchy. Today, pictures like these force us to confront how those who thought themselves superior constructed an image of those deemed the other. Re-examining and critiquing these postcards really helps us understand the nuances of history. The postcards themselves moved through so many different facets of life at the time, whether it's the post office or through colonial offices, right, through the hands of, you know, everyday citizens. These were artifacts that really made it into every niche of life. And so we really should understand them as artifacts of our histories, tangible objects that have come through history with us. People have talked a lot about how Photoshop or video manipulation has introduced the possibility that images can be doctored or falsified, but what these colonial photographs show is that they've always been doctored and falsified. They've always been put to political use. And it's our job to become viewers who are more critical and better able to see what they actually show, which is the violence of the colonial vision. To become viewers capable of looking past the margins and uh, rescuing the information that, that is there that we are trained not to look at. And finally, a more contemporary form of stereotyping, Hollywood style. The movie industry leans heavily on stereotypes wherever those films are set, but directors tend to lose the plot completely when they're depicting the Global South. Suddenly, the celluloid takes on a sepia tint, shamanic ritual tea is served, and the Islamic call to prayer turns into the unofficial soundtrack. This next TikTok by stand-up comedian, content creator Finley Christie captures a few of those stereotypes and more in just 40 seconds. Here's betting that you can't watch this video without having a few pretty well-known films come to mind. We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post. American character, welcome to Pakistan. Professor, where's the artifact? Steady on, old chap. The shaman requires you undergo the ritual tea ceremony first. I don't have time to sit around and drink tea. The ceremony is very important to the locals. Ah, shukriya, Faisal, shukriya. Maria, come meet the other American. Maria and I are old colleagues. She saved my ass back in Istanbul. Things got pretty hairy. I was just doing my job. You did the same for me in 10 years. Nice to meet you, sir. Now, let me take you through a busy fabric market and then a low-ceiling house with beads instead of a front door. 